This is Gina Sinceri with ABC News, live from Building 9 at the Johnson Space Center. We're looking at the Orion capsule that NASA, Will, and Lockheed Martin will launch into space on Thursday. This is the building where the astronauts and engineers train for upcoming missions. With me today is Kelly Smith. Kelly is the trajectory officer for this mission uh, and also star of the Trial by Fire YouTube video. Kelly, why don't you show me this capsule? What you got here? Sure, so this is the Orion capsule. It's uh, quite a bit larger than the original Apollo capsules from the 70s. Uh, uh, Orion is about five meters in diameter, whereas Apollo is about four meters in diameter. So that's about a, a three foot uh, in, uh, increase in diameter. But of course, area goes according to the square of the radius, so it's much, much larger is what I'm trying to get across. So we could call this Apollo on steroids? What would you say? <laughs> yeah, so uh, Orion has been called Apollo on steroids um, back since the Constellation days. It's designed to be um, bigger, hold, uh, carry larger crews, stay in, stay, stay in space longer, as well as uh, you know, just uh, come back from deep space uh, destinations. Orion or Apollo was sized for lunar returns. Orion is being sized for deep space returns from asteroids, from the Mar from Mars, from other destinations. Okay, but this is not going to be an easy flight, is it? Let's let's look at this capsule. Sure. So wow, a, you got a duck, don't you? <laughs> yeah, so I'm a pretty tall guy, so yeah. Orion would be pretty cramped for me. Um, but Orion is designed to carry four astronauts for up to 25 days uh, to deep space missions. That's currently uh, the mission design length for uh, the 2018 mission to go around uh, the moon uh, to carry no crew, and then subsequently it will carry uh, astronauts on a mission to what's called a distant retrograde orbit around the moon where they will rendezvous with an asteroid that will have been tugged there by a robotic uh, spacecraft. But still, that's going to be cramped for a long-term mission, isn't it? Will there be any kind of, uh, you know, capsule like on the Soyuz where they can go hang out and cook and sleep as well? So there's going to be habitability mo uh, modules that will be developed um, for subsequent missions, uh, is my understanding. But for the uh, missions to an asteroid or to going to around the moon, just like Apollo, this is it. Um, now, Apollo also had the luxury of a lunar module, but since we're not going to be landing on the moon, we don't get to take advantage of that additional volume. What are the challenges for this EFT-1, as you call it, this flight test coming up on Thursday? They're the Van Allen belt. I mean, you've got lots going on, don't you? So tell me a little bit about that. So this is going to be the first time that Orion will have ever flown in space before. So uh, although Orion, you know, people look at Orion and they say it just looks like Apollo, it's the same exact shape. Well, that's true. Physics haven't changed in the past 40 years, despite the fact that we have smartphones. We still don't have hoverboards because the physics haven't changed, right? Yeah. So Orion is uh, shaped very similarly because it's kind of like a tank. It's useful for coming back to, uh, uh, to Earth from outer space. I like to think of the space shuttle performance more like a Ferrari. This is more like a tank. They, they serve different purposes. And so uh, some of the challenges on EFT-1, uh, we're going to be flying all new avionics, all new, uh, you know, we have all these new mechanisms and pyrotechnic devices that have to get tested. We want to test all these things prior to putting a crew um, in here to keep the crew safe. Uh, we're going to be flying uh, with a GPS receiver for this mission. Now recall that shuttle was designed and conceived in the 70s um, from the ashes of Apollo. And so it was built with 70s hardware and technology in mind. We have, G we have a, you know, a healthy GPS constellation that we can use for navigation. We have a brand new guidance uh, algorithm that's going to be steering this vehicle through the atmosphere to hit its target in the ocean with pinpoint accuracy. It's going to be a very exciting test because we're going to be testing the parachutes and everything all together. On the ground, Those parachutes are pretty big too, aren't they? Yeah, absolutely. So Orion has actually 11 parachutes that it's going to be deploying on, entry, or, uh, on the EFT-1. The first uh, parachutes are going to be uh, uh, carrying off the forward bay cover, which is a protective covering on top of the capsule that protects the parachutes during space. That thing gets pulled off by three small parachutes, and I say small, they're, they're actually pretty good size, uh, but they're small relatively speaking. Next come out two drogue parachutes, each of which is about 10, meter, or 10 feet in diameter. Those slow the vehicle and stabilize the vehicle to prevent it from tumbling as it is descending uh, from supersonic speeds to subsonic speeds. Then three yeah. main parachutes come out and together they comprise the area of uh, about the size of an American football field, so it's pretty big. 
And there's going to be a time when you won't know, you won't be able to hear anything from Orion on descent. Tell me why. Yeah, so when Orion uh, is coming back into the atmosphere, remember, it's going 20,000 miles per hour when it hits the top of the atmosphere. So back from science class, remember that uh, uh, nitrogen atoms, for instance, are N2. There's two nitrogen atoms together and they make a molecule. If something hits those sufficiently hard with enough energy, like what Orion's going to be doing as it plows into the atmosphere, what actually happens is the molecules, or the atom, or the, the molecule splits right. and you create ions. That ionized flow, or those ionized atoms, flow around the outside of uh, the Orion. And those ions don't allow, or they corrupt and uh, mess up radio signals that we use to communicate with the vehicle. So we call that the plasma trail that in, is going to envelop the vehicle and cover it. That's going to hamper our communications with the vehicle during the most dangerous, most exciting part of the entry. So we're not going to get all the data back. Or it's, or it's expected not to get all the data back until after uh, the flight is actually over. So basically, lights go out and then lights come back on uh, late uh, uh, during entry. Some of this we've done before. I mean, the, the Navy and NASA have got lots of practice from the Apollo days of capturing, uh, of, of capsules splashing down. But the technology, has it improved any since the Apollo days? Yeah, so, we, you know, that was 40 years ago. And so it's been a long time. So I don't think really anyone in the Navy today was a part of uh, those Apollo landings. There may be some old graybeards that were participated, but they're really, you know, a lot of the corporal knowledge uh, from all those techniques has kind of been lost due to time. And so we've been working with the Navy to uh, develop uh, recovery procedures to bring the vehicle into what's called a well deck ship, a Navy well deck ship. Basically, the ship will kind of partially submerge its back end open up an end gate, kind of like a pickup truck, yeah. and then they'll just tug the Orion capsule in using small uh, rigid hull inflatable boats. Um, you don't put people on this for a, first, uh, for a first flight for very good reason, right? What's that reason? <laughs> so it's dangerous. Space flight is inherently dangerous, as evidenced by the recent uh, Antares rocket explosion yeah. upon liftoff and the, the Virgin Galactic uh, accident. Space flight is hard, and it takes a lot of very smart people working very hard and you know, it's, it's not a sure thing, even when you think you've done everything right. So space flight is hard. Uh, you know, we're excited to be launching uh, Orion to gather data on all the performance so we can get smarter about what this capsule is really capable of doing before we put humans in. What's exciting to you about the potential that Orion has? Where can you go with this capsule? So Orion is currently being sized, as I said before, to be able to support deep space missions. That is going to the moon, going to uh, orbit to an asteroid that's orbiting the moon or an asteroid or other points in space called Lagrange points. We could go to Mars with this uh, capsule. The heat shield is, is the thing that uh, constrains it because of what we can survive returning back from deep space. The further out we go in deep space, the faster we're going to be going when we come back to Earth. And so that's the, the key part of this test, is to test out the heat shield. How fast and how hot will it be when, when this capsule hits? Interface is it uh, entry. entry interface? Yeah, that's what we right. call it. Okay. Basically, how fast and how hot? <laughs> so it's going to be uh, hitting the top of the atmosphere about twenty thousand miles per hour. So to put that into, into context, that's about twenty nine thousand feet per second, or almost six miles per second. That's how fast this capsule that I'm sitting in is going to be flying. All and, right. And it, yeah. when it uh, heating up to its hottest point, it should be heated up to over four thousand degrees on the heat shield. Wow. But you've got data from the Apollo missions. That must have helped you when you came to designing this, correct? Absolutely. That data was very valuable. However, the size and the shape are different. The materials that we're using are different. And so we get to draw from that information, but we have a new capsule and you have to get new data to kind of test out all the systems. And that's what the purpose of UFT1 is. Thank you very much, Kelly. I'm going to close with a wide shot of this capsule. This is the high fidelity mock-up that will be going to space on Thursday. Live from the Johnson Space Center, Gina Sinceri, ABC News.